tonight and be able to study the Word of God together, be able to pray and uh, know, Lord, that you hear us and, Lord, you answer every prayer in accordance with your will. And so we pray for your blessing tonight that you would send that Holy Spirit upon us, be our teacher and guide through the Scriptures. And I pray, Lord, that everything will be done this evening, whether in the children's program or here in our adult study. I pray, Lord, that Christ's name will be lifted up, and our God will be honored. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> you can be seated. You should have a lesson uh, entitled Godly Countenance, and uh, we'll be looking into Acts chapter 16. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 6 and reading verses 1 through 15, and then uh, looking at uh, verse 15 as our text verse. It says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Uh, then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, uh, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and uh, Procurius, and uh, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of the faith and power, and did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which called this, uh, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And then they, uh, suborned men, uh, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and of the scribes and, and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and it shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Uh, let's pray together. God, I pray that you would just bless us and help us, Lord, to understand the scripture. May we be able to really see um, uh, Stephen's life and just see how God worked and moved through him. And I pray that we might be able to gain that uh, same understanding and, Lord, just a, a spirit of revelation to others uh, that they might know who Jesus is. So bless the preaching in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text verse is verse 15. It says, And all that sat... Uh, in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. A godly countenance. Uh, Stephen's life was different from others that were around him. Uh, they literally could see the testimony of the Lord on his face. They could see that he was a man uh, that was not just only appointed by men, but he was appointed and used of. By God, so we, it was recorded here in chapter six is simply this matter of the appointment of the first deacons in the early church. Uh, one of the men was named Stephen. He is interesting because of the fact if you uh, take note of the fact that the burdens of the apostles were lifted 
uh, when they had numbered these deacons and established these deacons in the church. In verse 7, it says the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And it's because of the fact they had men uh, that were godly men that were in the church making sure people's needs were being met. And Stephen was one of them. And so much so, uh, they identified him as having a face of an angel. Uh, Stephen, although taking on a greater responsibility and burdens, was viewed as others as one who had literally uh, the countenance, if you will, of God upon him. And so we want to have a godly countenance. We want people to be able to look at us and just looking at us know that there's something different about us. And uh, I always think of my great-grandmother as a kid, uh, just a young child, uh, going over to my great-grandmother's house over in Pittman. And I never knew what, what, the, what it was all about, but she just had a face that she was always smiling, she was sweet, and uh, she always would share Bible verses with us, and I didn't understand anything what was going on. And so when I think of someone who has a godly countenance, I've always thought about her. Now, my, when I left to go to Bible college, my mom gave me her Bible, and I still have her old Bible, her notes in there, and notes about revival meetings and, and Pittman and everything. And uh, it's just a, a blessing to be able to know somebody that has that godly countenance upon them. Um, I, Joanne and I had a voice teacher when we were in Bible college. She was the same way. And I, uh, she'd always get these worried looks on her when I was trying to sing. She said, oh, oh Mr. Weibel. <laughs> We had, I, I had this thing they called it for juries. And there was, I told her, she said, you, you have to do a solo. And I said, I am not doing a solo. She said, you have to do a solo. And it was going to be this fancy thing where, uh, you know, the people, the college were there. Dr. Malone and Mrs. Malone was there and all these doctor degree people and everything and all fancy. And, and they, she wanted me to get up there and sing a song. I told her, it's not going to go well. And she'll do, you'll do fine, Mr. Weibel. I can see her face now. And I remember getting up there and saying, and I forgot the words. And so I stopped singing. And I said, and so I, she started over, and I could see this worried look coming on her face. And I started singing again, and I forgot the words again. And me, as myself is, I just, I said, I, don't worry, folks. Just relax. I said, I'm going to get it right here in a minute. <laughs> I started singing again. And Mrs. Malone was sitting over there cringing on the front pew. Mrs. Lehman was sitting there on the piano playing, well, not Mr. Weigel. And, uh, but she was very gracious. She, she always showed forth a godly testimony, not just in the words that she said, but in her countenance how she presented herself. You would just literally be able to see the face of God on her. The happiest people I know are those who are willing to give their life to God for service. And you're willing, whether it be a full-time uh, position or whether it be just work, helping and working out in the local church, uh, I'll tell you, the, make, the thing that makes a difference in the church in reaching people is the countenance of people in the church. My countenance, your countenance, uh, we need to show forth a godly countenance. As you look at Stephen's life, you see a few things here. I'll put down in your introductory notes there. Uh, careful examination enables us to see his challenges. He had challenges to overcome. Oftentimes we read about people in the Bible and we think, well, they just had it made because they were so close to God. But they had challenges just like you and I had. And notice, first of all, we see in verse 8, uh, it, he, uh, Stephen was one that worked hard. And it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So there was multitudes that were coming into the church. We know on the day of Pentecost, there was uh, 3,000 people saved. Uh, we know that when you get over in Acts chapter 4, there's 4,000 people saved. And uh, so all this that was going on, these men were appointed to oversee the ministry because of how much work had to be done 
in meeting people's needs. You know, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, that, he, that the grace of God was upon him. He said, but I labored more abundantly than you all. Paul identifies the fact there was much, much work to be done. He tells Timothy, challenges Timothy with the fact of being a part of the work of God. Now, he didn't they say it to uh, take your ease in, in ministry. He says the work of ministry. Notice in verse 9, Stephen would have to debate his position. Then uh, there were, arose certain of the synagogue, which is called in the synagogue, the Libertines uh, and uh, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and then was Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. So he had to debate his position. Uh, you know, when you're living for God, you're serving others, and you're trying to be a testimony for the Lord, there's always going to be somebody that's going to try to debate uh, with you about your position and who you are in Christ and what you believe and how you live. And so he had that challenge. Uh, he had verse 12, and let her see there, he was taken captive. It says, and they stirred up the people and the elders of the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. I mean, he was taken captive. Uh, challenges to overcome in this matter of doing the ministry uh, that was given to him. In verse 13, notice he was falsely accused. It says, and he set up false uh, uh, and set up false witnesses, which said, "This man ceases not to blasphemous, uh, speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law." Falsely accused and. Uh, we need, he, yet through all of this that he's dealing with, he's still, the conclusion is that he had a face of an angel. He had a godly countenance that he maintained in living his life. In verse 14, we see that he was misunderstood. Before we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall ch destroy this place and shall change the custom of Moses uh, delivered unto us. And so he was uh, misunderstood by those that were questioning. And then letter F there, he was scrutinized by the council. It says, and all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him. And so he's being scrutinized by the uh, council uh, that has taken him captive and questioned him and, and aggressively attacking him. But yet, in the midst of all of it, he still maintains a godly countenance. Be careful that you don't allow people to rob you of the joy of the Lord. Be careful you don't allow people to cause you, to, to allow your countenance to fall, to cause you to act like and respond in an unchristian way, whatever the dealings is or whatever it is you're going through. And so uh, he was scrutinized. All this opposition. And so what was the secret? What was it that he did to keep shining for Jesus Christ? Here's a few thoughts because they're listed in the qualifications uh, that are mentioned. In verse 3, notice, first of all, that he was uh, full of honesty. It says, Wherefore look ye out among you of seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, uh, whom we may appoint over this business. So we see, first of all, he was full of honesty. And, uh, you know, you can tell a liar when somebody's lying to you. And I um, always, <laughs> always get a pretty uh, funny, I was going to say tickled, but I'm not going to say that because I keep saying that all the time. It's one of my filler words that has become a problem, amen, so I'm going to get that out. But I was tickled anyway. And uh, when you deal with kids and they're in trouble, they broke the rules or whatever, you sit down and, all right, tell me what happened. Well, Oh, no, I didn't do nothing. And you can see it's written all over the face. They're guilty. And uh, you got to try to get it out of them. The problem is this. If we're not full of honesty, letter A is just so we a liar has no peace. And you see that when you deal with somebody that's lying, uh, they don't have any peace about the situation. They're, they're not comfortable in the situation. They're fidgeting in the situation. Uh, why? Because a, a liar never has any peace. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 1 says, Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. And so uh, it's better for us just to be honest. And uh, my dad always told me, he said, Boy, uh, you tell the truth and take your punishment like a man. 
He said, you don't lie about things, you tell the truth. And I've always, that's always stuck with me, although I know I didn't always tell the truth. Try to get out of things, and what happens, Proverbs 19.22, in your notes there, says a poor man is better than a liar. And the next thing you know, you find yourself in more trouble and more difficulties, especially as a Christian. We want people to be able to trust us. And the only way they're going to trust what we're saying is if we're honest about who we are and about who God is. And uh, people may not like what you have to say, but be honest with people. Uh, we can be gracious and we can be merciful at the same time of being honest. And Stephen, in dealing with the, all that he had to deal with in the early church and the struggles and challenges he would face, he was willing to be at full of honesty. And so watch out, don't be a liar, a liar has no peace. Let her be there. Gossip cannot look you in the face. And uh, I, always, <laughs> I always like it when I go into the store grocery store or Home Depot or something, there's somebody in there that used to come to church here, amen, and they see me, and I see them run for the next aisle. <laughs> it's not going to do you any good because I'm going to go around the other way and run into you, amen, because I want to say hi. Now, I have no guile against anyone, and uh, but what happens when people are talking about you, uh, they can't look you in the face. Uh, and listen, Stephen was a man who was not only honest by not lying, but he was a man who was honest because he didn't talk about other people. Proverbs, you've seen your notes, Proverbs 18 and verse 8 says, the words of a talebearer are as a wounds. And uh, we have to be careful what we say, who we talk about, uh, what we talk about, because of the fact the words that we say do hurt people and, and, and wounds people. It's hard for me have a godly countenance while I'm verbally putting down someone else. In uh, Proverbs chapter 26 and 20 says, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. Uh, so where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. And so Stephen was able to address issues and difficulties in the church because he was an honest man. Uh, he didn't lie, he didn't gossip. And then let her see there in your notes is a backbiter uh, is always worried about being exposed. And uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 15 says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody, that's a backbiter, uh, in other man's matters. And so it, it's really none of your business what goes on in somebody else's life. And I've had people over the years that say something to me about, well, what about so-and-so? And I've tried to be kind and said, well, you know, I'm not talking about, I don't have, I'm not taking any liberty to talk about that. And well, what, well, what about this? That? No, I'm not going to talk about it. And uh, we have uh, all the times in our Christian school, we'll have situations go on with a student and without fail, somebody will come and say, well, what about so-and-so? It's none of your business. I'm not going to talk about it. And so backbiting, gossiping, and lying will hinder your ability to be able to minister to others. Stephen had the face of an angel. He had a godly countenance because he was full of honesty. Uh, ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson said this, people all over the nation are starved for honesty and common sense. And I read that quote, I thought, my goodness, that is so true. This world we're living in, to try to get somebody just to be truthful and honest and exercise some common sense is a challenge in itself, I'll tell you. And so in the church, certainly we as believers in the church ought to be striving to be full of wisdom. Albert Einstein said, whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted with important matters. Uh, you know, Jesus said, to whom it's given, uh, to whom much is given, much is required. And I believe Stephen, by taking on this role as a deacon, there was much given to him. And he assumed that position with an honest spirit and pursued, pursued that position to minister to others 
by not becoming a backbiter or gossip or liar. So we want to be full of honesty. If there's some place that people can look to, to, to trust and believe that people are honest, it ought to be the church. And so we need to be a full of honesty. I see another thing, Roman number two in your notes there, that he was full of the Holy Spirit. And uh, tells us in verse 3, um, uh, where am I at here? Um, no, verse, yeah, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. And uh, if we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, there are some things that need to take place. We can see that as Jesus comes to the marriage supper in Cana of Galilee, and you see what takes place as he gives them fresh wine to drink. Uh, notice, first of all, uh, letter A there in your notes is there is an emptying that has to take place in John chapter 2 and uh, verse 6. It says, And there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. And so if you're going to be able to fill up the pot, it has to be empty to begin with. And the fullness of the Holy Spirit uh, we need to be emptied of ourselves. We need to be empty of sin. We need to be uh, uh, not just empty, but we need to be purified. Letter B is there's a purifying that takes place. Because it says here, after the matter of the purifying of the Jews. And so Jesus is given a good illustration here as he blesses and, and creates fresh wine to drink. Uh, it reminds us of uh, Elijah back in 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, when the widow needed uh, oil and needed money to pay her debts, Elijah would direct her to go get vessels. And he, I like what it says. And it says, and not a few. In other words, he said, if you want a lot, you got to bring a lot of vessels. And then he blesses their pouring the oil in. The oil keeps running until the vessels were full. And so uh, uh, when the vessels were full, they had no more room to put it, then the flow of the oil ceased. Well, Jesus is using that same type of illustration here in John chapter 2. And he's showing for it there has to be empty vessels. Are you willing to empty yourself to be able to be filled with God? And then there was a purifying that needed to take place because Jesus is making a pure juice, a pure wine to be able to be drunk. And then in John chapter 2 and verse 7, we see God's commanding. And it says, And Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And so God has commands for us. And Stephen is not arguing with God. He's filled with the Holy Spirit because what God commands him to do, he's willing to do. And then I see there was the result of them yielding uh, to Jesus Christ in John chapter 2 and verse 5. And his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. So there was a yielding to the authority of Christ. There was a yielding to the instruction of God. And what that yielding produced is the fact that it results of your obeying. And so if you're going to be willing to yield to God, it'll be easy for you to obey God. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And so the disciples just went and got the pots and they filled it with water like Jesus told them to. And uh, not only did they obey and be able to experience that filling, but letter F there in your notes, it's produced an overflow. Notice in uh, verse 7 of John 2, it says, And Jesus said, Let them fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And so much so that God was going to give an overflow. The fullness of the Holy Spirit, when we empty ourselves of ourselves, allowing God's Spirit to convict us and purify us, it's easy to follow the commands what God has said to us, uh, when we're completely yielded and obedient and experience an overflowing, if you will, of the Spirit of God on others. Stephen was able to impact the others, I believe, because of the fullness of the Spirit of God overflowing through him and impacting them. 
And what a good thing it is uh, to be able to know that God would be able to uh, move in our life in a great way. I remember, uh, I forget the preacher's name now, but he was uh, saying uh, that uh, uh, his father uh, walked with God, and this is a preacher from South Africa, and uh, his father uh, went into a place of business to talk to the boss, and literally he said this, in, when he walked in, immediately people started getting under conviction because of who he was and what he believed. Literally, people started surrendering their life to Christ just because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit that flowed through this man to impact them and cause them uh, to, to know that they needed to get right with God. The fullness of the Holy Spirit. I, I want the fullness of the Holy Spirit on my life in such a way that I don't even have to say a word. And I don't even need to say anything whatsoever, but there's a conviction that comes on people that you come in contact with. And, uh, and really, without the Spirit of God moving through us, uh, everything that we do is just generated by man, and it needs to be generated by God. And Stephen was a man who had the overflowing of the Holy Spirit in him. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without wind. We are useless. And so I need to come back to the reality that we need to be uh, uh, honest people, full of honesty, but we also need to be full of the Holy Ghost. Warren Worsby said this, it is futile for us to serve God without the power of the Holy Spirit. Talent, training, and experience cannot take the place of the power of the Spirit. Amen. And uh, I appreciate seminars, and I, I, I go to different things like that over the years. I like to be taught the Word of God, uh, but the greatest thing that I can do in serving the Lord and uh, ministering to others is to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. And every one of us need to have that fullness. So he was full of honesty. He was full of the Holy Ghost. Then we see in our notes there that he was full of wisdom because it says in verse 3 that they needed to be full of wisdom. And verse 10 tells us, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And so wisdom of God resting upon him. This wisdom that God has for us can be gained by everyone. James 1, 5 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And so God can give you wisdom, not worldly wisdom. We need godly wisdom. We need the wisdom that we can only be found in the scriptures. And so full of wisdom can be gained by every one of us. Uh, this wisdom comes by a proper perspective of who God is. And uh, I can't, listen, I cannot evaluate who God is based on what the world has to say. I have to evaluate who God is by what the Word of God has to say. I need the Holy Spirit to be my teacher to take me through the Word of God so that I might be able to comprehend who God is and now it'll affect me and others around me. Proverbs 3 and 7 says, Be not wise in their own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And so it's not about gaining knowledge based on uh, our perception, but it's a matter of gaining knowledge based on the reality of who Christ is in the Word of God. Then I see this. Uh, well, full of wisdom, it, contains, it continues by the Word of God. And so uh, we might learn a few Bible verses, and I've seen this over the years. Somebody who learns a few Bible verses, then they think they're a scholar, and they don't study the Bible anymore. The Bible is a book to be studied from the, the beginning of your life as a Christian right all the way through to your life when you go to heaven. And you need to be students of the Word. And uh, uh, how can you show forth the testimony and the countenance of God if you don't know what the Word of God says. 
in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof fall, falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. A godly countenance. And it has to be a godly countenance uh, that is based on the fact of what the word of God is continuing to do in my life. I remember this fellow when I was in Bible college, uh, he taught the book of Revelation, Dr. Halter. I'll never forget him. He was an old man when I went to Bible college. I know he's in heaven now. Uh, he always carried a little New Testament in his shirt pocket right here. And he'd always tell us, he'd say, and, and his test, I'll tell you, the stuff he made us uh, memorize. Now, uh, during the one semester, we had to read through the book of Revelation seven times uh, and, do, and then do, a, a, I think it was a 30-page report at the end of the semester. And then his test that he gave us was outrageous. And, and, but he... I mean, he always had that Bible in his pocket. And he would tell us, he said, Men, you need to carry the Word of God with you. The Word of God is alive, and it continues, and it's an eternal book. You need to have the Word of God. And he said, If I'm sitting in the doctor's office waiting to go in, I open up the Bible and I start reading it. He said, If I'm somewhere else and I have to wait, if I'm sitting down for just a moment, I open up the Bible and I read it. He said, The Bible has to become a part of your life. And uh, in order for you to have the wisdom to be able to deal with issues in life that you have to deal with. And, the, and listen, the days we are living in, how we desperately need to know what the Bible says about all these issues Amen. Uh, that is confronting us. And we need to know about it and deal with it in a way that we have a godly countenance. It's not about being mean and brash and arrogant. It's about being loving, kind, and gracious. And so I need wisdom in order to be able to do that. Then we find in our text, in verse 8, that he was full of power. And how do I know he was full of power? Uh, because of the fact, the letter A there in your notes, he accomplished great things, it says. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles. And so we need to expect great things from God, believe great things from God, and just enjoy God doing great things. He accomplished great things. Not only that, but he performed miracles. I believe we serve a God who can still do miracles. I don't believe in divine healers, but I believe in a God who is divine and holy and who can heal. And so we need to be full of the power of God. Not only that, but he proclaimed uh, uh, God's word. Uh, you don't think so. You read chapter 7. We don't have time to do that. But chapter 7 is the sermon that Stephen preached with the power of God resting upon him that caused conviction to come on everyone. And they took him out to stone him to death. And in the process of being stoned to death, they saw the testimony of God in the face of Stephen. And so uh, he had a godly countenance. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, with the goodness of God... Uh, uh, to desire or highest welfare, our highest welfare, the wisdom of God to plan it, and the power of God to achieve it, what do we lack? Surely we are the most favored of all creatures. And I, I think people have forgotten that, that God has placed his favor on us because he has created us in his image. And because he created us in his image, he has a plan and a will for us to accomplish. And we're able to do that because of the fullness of the power of God that is rested on us. Then uh, we see uh, he was full of faith, according to five, verse 5 and also verse 8. It says, in saying, the pleased the multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And so he was a man full of faith. Do you have faith just to believe God for our everyday needs? Do you have faith to believe God for those miracles that you need in your life? Now, letter A there on your notes is just tell you this. Faith must have an object to rest on. 
And Ephesians 1.15 says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, faith has an object to rest on. So my, what is my faith? What am I, who am I putting my faith in? Who, who's, who's literally carrying the load of the reality of what I believe? It's Jesus Christ. And you have to have an object for your faith to lay on. Then letter B, faith must have a source it comes from. And so I have my faith on Jesus Christ because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the resource that my faith comes from is the word of God and it's placed on the person of Jesus Christ. And so I can be full of faith. We say, well, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ by what the Word of God says, and you'll be saved. And that's true. You believe, and then you're saved. But listen, tomorrow, if you're going to still be saved, that you believe, and you're trusting Jesus Christ. If I need my needs met later on in my life, the next week, the next day, the next 10 years, whatever, it's faith that I gain from reading the Word of God. That's the source of my faith. But my object of my faith is Jesus Christ who said he'd never leave me nor forsake me. And so we have this. I, I don't have time to develop this thought, but real quickly I'll just look in Romans chapter 1. Uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 5 and verse 8. Um, I thought about this several years ago. It says, by whom we have received God, uh, grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And then in verse 8 it says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole, whole world. There is the faith and there is your faith. The faith is faith in Christ no matter where you are in this world. Your faith is how much do you believe in to him, believe on him right now. And with my source of faith coming from the word of God, then I have clearly an object to put my faith in, and that is Jesus Christ. Well, here's, here's a couple of thoughts there on your last page in your notes. Uh, number one is just simply this. The strength of your faith is proportionate to the time spent in the Word of God. And without fail, people over the years I've talked with them and they say, well, I don't know, I just feel like I'm losing my faith. And I'll ask them, well, how's your devotional life? And I'll guarantee you, it's non-existent. Why? Because your faith, the strength of your faith, is proportionate to the time that you spend in the Word of God. Why? Because that's the source of faith is the Word of God. So if I'm not spending any time in the Word of God, I'm not drawing any inferences or any information in reference to what faith is all about. So my faith is going to get weak. So that's number two. The weakness of your faith is proportionate to the lack of time spent in the Word of God. And so here was Stephen. He was a man who had the face of an angel. He was a man who had a godly countenance. And it's simply because of the fact that he was full of honesty. He was full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, he was full of wisdom. And he was full of power. And he was full of faith. And that's what we need to do is we need to be like Stephen. And allow the Lord to grow us by his grace and strengthen us so that we might have a godly countenance. When people look at us, they say, wow, that's somebody I want to be like. Uh, they don't want, listen, people aren't going to say, oh, I want to know who Jesus is. And they see you all grumpy and argumentative and downtrodden all the time. And I, I've just, I have found this, I really have, that, that whether you're going to be Happy or whether you're going to be despondent is your own choice. Every morning when I get up, I have to decide, am I going to get up and enjoy this day and expect great things from God? Or am I going to lay in bed and whine and complain and grumble about my back hurting me? <laughs> you know? And my back ain't hurting, my foot's hurting. Amen. So I have to make a choice. What am I going to focus on? 
I get up every I listen every morning I pray and I say Lord help me get through this day I say God give me the strength give me the strength Lord to be a testimony for you today help me help me God see something miraculous that you're going to do through my life help me to have a godly countenance you know my dad was stern I was in the Marine Corps they tell you don't smile Hey, I know I'm a mean looking dude sometimes and um, I, I have to I literally have to ask Lord, the Lord to give me grace to have the right countenance and because I just assume be mean I just assume just be indifferent I just assume be by myself but that's not what God's called me to do that's not what God's called me to be he's called me to be a Christian He's called me to be a godly example. He's called me to have a countenance that tells forth the testimony of the praise of God. And so Stephen is a good example for us to look at and study together. So read through those, some of those verses we didn't look up and just ask the Lord to help you uh, to show forth the praises of God. Amen. A godly countenance. What we need to pray tonight, is there anything that we need to add to the prayer sheet? Um, be for sure to be praying for Bev. She went home. She wasn't feeling well today. So uh, be sure to pray for her. Uh, anything else we need to add? Yes, Charlotte. Praise God together and thank the Lord for great surgery that went well and God brought her out of there fast and quickly. Amen. Pray for complete healing. Anything else we need to pray about? Anything at all? Okay, we got everybody on there. Good. Well, be sure to be praying for this Sunday that we'll have a great day in the house of God. Be praying for Pastor Dewana as he's on vacation. And uh, pray for yourselves. You have to watch me lead music. You'll be <laughs> rejoicing when he gets back. Amen. Hopefully he's not watching. And I'll get mad because I said something about it. <laughs> well, God bless you for being here tonight. Amen. Let's get together and pray over these folks.